Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeff Maitland, and welcome to this webinar on the iChemie's Green Paper on Carbon Capture and Storage. Thanks for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. I'm going to give a brief overview of the Green Paper that was launched on the 11th of April this year, uh, which seeks to look at the challenges and opportunities for delivering carbon capture and storage at large scale and to look at what opportunities there are for chemical engineers to contribute to that process. And I just want briefly to acknowledge the uh, 27 members of that uh, task group. Uh, the first setter on your screen now, I don't have time to go through them in detail there in, in the report, but I would particularly like to acknowledge the support from Jacob Orbit, who was policy officer at the time at the iChemie Energy Centre, through which this uh, study and report was issued, and also Alana Collis, uh, who's our host today, uh, will keep me in line when we come to question and answers uh, as the Energy, uh, Energy Centre Manager. So before we start, uh, uh, what I thought what I'd do is to just get a, a rain check on uh, what you online think about uh, CCS. Uh, you may know a lot about it, you may not know too much and uh, have joined the webinar to hear about it, but the question I'd like to ask is, do you think CCS will play a significant role in decarbonizing the drive to get the, the climate change conference in Paris in 2015, the carbon mitigation targets that were agreed internationally there? So I'm going to hand over to Alana to uh, put the poll up and I'd like you to say yes or no, or perhaps you're undecided on that. I see that poll's building up uh, at the moment. Uh, I see 70% or so of you think that it will. Uh, at 10% don't think that it will, and uh, at least a quarter uh, undecided. I'm not sure. So hopefully over the next 40 minutes or so, we'll provide some illumination on that, and we'll we'll see how your views might be influenced by uh, what this green paper's got to say. Okay, Alana, okay for me to carry on? We close the poll, thank you. So, <clears throat> just a brief overview of what carbon capture and storage is. It's the technology whereby uh, CO2 or other greenhouse gases that are emitted centrally in uh, power stations or uh, industrial plant uh, can be captured uh, at source, then compressed to a supercritical state and transported to be stored usually underground in uh, one of three main sets of store. Um, we have depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Uh, deep saline aquifers and unminable coal seams, which have a significant storage capacity. Worldwide, it's estimated that there's at least over 2,000 gigatons of capacity to store CO2 um, from these various sources of power, heating, or industrial processes. Uh, and if we look at the need for such technology. Uh, these are uh, the, re the results of a whole range of what are called integrated assessment models. They're predictions of how CO2 uh, on the left, the emissions in gigatons per year, which is currently uh, just over 30 gigatons per annum, uh, how that will evolve in time under certain scenarios. And the, uh, the bunch of red scenarios at the top uh, are those that if we carry on essentially business as usual and we'll end up in 2050 
with over a thousand parts per million of uh, CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere, uh, compared with approximately uh, 400 now. Um, the Paris Agreement of 1.5 and a maximum two degrees mean global temperature rise would re require this to be capped at about 450 parts per million. And the blue scenarios at the bottom, of which the mean is the, the thick line, uh, show those scenarios that would meet uh, the, the Paris Accord and, in fact, uh, cap things at uh, about 450 parts per million. And we can see there that by 21 we need to, in fact, have taken carbon out of the atmosphere to achieve that target. So this is very, very challenging indeed. What I want to point out is that of these scenarios, all those that don't use CCS cost on average about 40% more than those that do. And that without CCS, less than 50% of these scenarios actually solve the problem to get us to the Paris targets. Uh, and those that do do it without CCS are significantly more expensive, uh, some estimates 30, 40% more expensive. So uh, if we just go with renewables and nuclear, we introduce those early when the costs are high, the costs will be higher. So CCS is on the critical path to uh, reaching our climate change targets at optimal costs. And another thing to point out is that uh, if we want to get to this negative uh, emissions, as they're called, uh, later in this century, that the only technology at scale that's capable of doing this is uh, to produce our energy from biomass, where uh, uh, the CO2, of course, has been consumed by photosynthesis into uh, bio crops and uh, the bio feedstocks, and then to capture the CO2 so that we, in fact, take the CO2 uh, um, out of the atmosphere and we have net negative emissions technology. So if I provide you with a, a simplified version of that uh, rather complex plot. This rainbow picture here is a similar plot. It, the top line of is the uh, business as usual and the bottom is where we need to get to. And you can see that by 2050, the difference between the 14 gigatons Per annum that we'll be emitting then compared with that we need to emit then uh, to meet the targets and the over 60 gigatons that we'll emit if we do nothing uh, we, we need to take out of the system about 50 gigatons of co2 per annum uh, compared with what we would do if we do we do nothing and the different colors tell you the different ways of doing this and there are three main ways one is uh, energy efficiency the low-lying fruit use less energy or switch to less uh, carbon intensive fuels, coal to gas and things like that, then there's about 50% um, of this 50 gigatons could be achieved that way. And about 30% of it could be achieved by renewables and nuclear. So that's just demonstration that renewables and nuclear and energy saving on their own cannot get us there. And there, then there's about 20% or 10 gigatons per annum that would need to be taken out by carbon capture and storage. And that's summarized on this next slide. Uh, if you look at the integral under that curve, we've got to avoid about eight, emitting 800 gigatons of CO2 by 2050. And 50% of that will do by energy efficiency, 30% by nuclear and renewables. We've still got this 20% that we need to take out of the system by continuing to use fossil fuels to meet our energy demands. And that amounts to 10 gigatons of CO2 per annum by 2050. That's globally, of course. Let's see where we are on this journey. This plot shows that, in fact, we've had carbon capture and storage going back to the 1970s. Uh, the blue blobs here, the size of the blob indicates the amount of CO2 stored. So the biggest uh, uh, pro project here takes out about eight uh, megatons per annum. Some of the smaller ones like Sleipner in the Norwegian North Sea take out one megaton per annum. Uh, and the green ones are those that are just dedicated storage on, on, on its own. The blue ones are where 
the injection of CO2 has been used to recover more oil and gas and hence generate revenue from CCS. And you see that they're in the majority. So, uh, so far, uh, CCS has only really been commercialized apart from a few cases where there is a revenue to pay for the additional costs of CCS because it adds on average, say, about 25% to the electricity cost if it's put on power stations, uh, depending on the technology that we're using. And if we look at that in a schematic way, if we go from 1972, where we had this uh, Valverde plant in the US uh, at a half a megaton per annum, uh, Sleipner, the oldest uh, project still running, is one megaton per annum in the Norwegian North Sea. That was 1996. Today, where we've got the, the most recent figures, there's about 20 commercial scale operations. And by that, I mean something of the order of one megaton per annum. Uh, there are smaller demonstration plants across the world, but the current capacity for storing CO2 uh, that's actually being done is a, just over 30 megatons per annum with an average capacity of about two uh, megatons per annum. If you look at the, the target that I've just described to you, uh, to meet the COP21, the Paris targets, that's it. The 10 gigatons per annum would be equivalent to about 2,000 projects that capture five megatons per annum. So we, the challenge by 2050 globally is that we've got to have far, far more. We've got to go up by a factor of almost 100 on the number of projects that we have. And uh, those have got to be bigger. Uh, and if we've got smaller capacity, then we'll need more projects. So this is a tremendous challenge for the global energy community. And this report set out to say, well, what are the blocks to making CCS a commercial reality? Why has this not really taken off when the, the need for it is so clear in the, the climate change evidence? And the first message from the report is that the barriers to doing this are not technical, that we have the technology to do this, despite what is sometimes said. There are two kinds of uh, carbon capture. You can either do it at the end of the pipe on the flue gas, the post-combustion process, illustrated in this slide where uh, you put a capture unit, uh, typically using amine type solvents to absorb the CO2. Uh, Pre-combustion is where you actually burn the fuel first and convert this to CO2 and hydrogen, and you capture the CO2 uh, first before you use the hydrogen for power and heat, uh, and you take the CO2 off and store it. Oxyfuel combustion, the third one there, is where rather than using air for your combustion process, whether it be for power, heat, or industry, uh, you use pure, pure oxygen, which means that it's uh, the fuel burns to CO2 and water, and you can separate the water off by condensation much more cheaply. Um, but the costs are shifted up front because you've got to actually separate the mainly nitrogen from the air. Uh, so you have cryogenic processes typically that give you pure oxygen. So it's potentially more efficient, but uh, the cost uh, ratio between upfront and downstream is, is different. And then industrial processes, on the whole, they're the same as post-combustion. You, although there are some variants on this, that you take the CO2 out from as, as a product from the uh, stream, both as a product from the energy production, and in some cases like cement, a product from the manufacturing process itself. And if we look at where the technologies for these three parts of carbon capture and storage, capture, transportation, by pipeline or ship, or sometimes uh, by tanker, but uh, those are the main options. And then storage in these three types of underground reservoir. We can see, if we look at the technology readiness levels, that there's a lot of technology still in the pipeline. But if you look at uh, TRL-8, which is commercially ready, and commercial, uh, TRL-9, which is commercial now, you'll see that uh, we, we have enough technology in those boxes that is proven technology, most of it at scale, uh, that we, we can go ahead. It may not yet be the optimized technology for lowest cost, but, but we have the technology to 
put this into commercial production. There will be some evolution over the next coming decades. This just shows that for capture, for instance, where mainly now we have amine solvents, that uh, those solvents will improve. Uh, there are many solid sorbent processes that are coming on stream. And in, in the future, advanced technologies such as membranes or using biological capture or ionic liquids or hybrids of these uh, will uh, become more efficient and bring the costs down as this technology matures. And just a couple of examples of these that are in the pipeline at the moment, molten carbonate fuel cells are an interesting way to actually combine natural gas as a, a fuel for a fuel cell with CO2 from flue gas to actually concentrate CO2 uh, to 70, 80% um, uh, in, in the flue gas stream. And at the same time, as capturing the CO2 to actually generate some energy from the, the fuel cell. So there's a double benefit of that technology that uh, will bring the cost down. And then there's the so-called Allen cycle invented by Rodney Allen, a fellow of the institution, uh, <clears throat> working with net power, where CO2 itself is used as the uh, working fluid in the uh, turbine rather than steam. And so this combines the capture of CO2 with the combustion process itself. This is currently in uh, field test in the States and uh, great hopes for this technology because its claim is that it can actually, uh, compared with conventional uh, combined cycle gas turbine power stations with, without CO2 capture, it can produce the same uh, efficiency of production uh, and the same cost of electricity production, uh, but uh, including the CO2. So the hope is that this sort of technology can reduce the costs of capture uh, to very low levels. Um, compared with conventional solvent capture. And the other thing I want to point out, I mentioned this bioenergy with CCS. This is the BEX technology where we use biomass and biofeedstocks uh, to generate power and by capturing the CO2 from the stacks it, in the uh, decades later in this century, we'll be able to, as we need to, uh, actually remove carbon from the uh, atmosphere. Um, this is much more efficient than the uh, greenhouse gas uh, direct capture technologies, which currently cost about $600 per tonne of CO2. Those will improve with time and probably make a contribution as well. But they're um, probably at least an order of magnitude more expensive than PEX technology. Something to men mention as well as people say, well, why bury a CO2? Why not use it to make things? And uh, uh, that's a very good argument and in fact there's quite a lot of technology that uses uh, carbon dioxide to make uh, particularly polymers um, and other chemicals. Uh, if we just look at that briefly, the feeling of the working group was that if you look at the required scale of CO2 emissions of 10 gigatons per annum by 2050, currently if you look at the whole of the chemical industry worldwide, we only use about 0.2 gigatons uh, per, per annum at the moment. And even if we were to use everything, uh, to make everything from CO2, we would only use a fraction of the CO2 that we need to take out of the atmosphere. So, uh, and some of the chemicals that we produce, are, or the fuels, we, we simply re-release the CO2 again. So. Whilst this will be an interesting technology for recycling CO2 and be a source of cheap source of carbon in the future as we capture more CO2, it's uh, and there'll be plenty of opportunities there, particularly where we can convert the CO2 to solid materials that really is just take it out of the system. Uh, it's unlikely to make a huge contribution to this 10 gigatons per annum that we need to take out of the system. But once you've captured the CO2, where there's a market, this technology will grow, I think. So the barriers are not technical, but we do need to do some other things. What, what, what is preventing uh, CCS being really taking off at commercial scale? Well, the first thing, as I've mentioned, is because it costs, adds a premium to the cost of either the products or 
whatever those are, be they cement, be they power or heat, uh, we, we need to provide a, a monetization route if possible for the CO2. And one way to do this is to use it to for EOR. Another route would be to uh, put a price on CO2 so that it's more expensive to emit the CO2 through a carbon tax or a trading system than it would be to actually capture and store it. And so the uh, I've said there that the energy penalty, so-called, uh, currently, depending on the technology, it can be plus or minus um, uh, several tens of dollars on the but if you take a mean value of about fifty dollars per ton of CO2 that's not far from uh, a realistic figure to work on uh, and as we've said you can get revenue generation through enhanced gas or oil recovery or a carbon pricing system tax trading or interestingly uh, in the United States recently they've introduced tax credits uh, the so-called 45Q tax, which uh, where people get tax credits for storing CO2. And this has had a, a, a really significant impact on the amount of carbon capture and storage and the, the number of commercial scale projects that are being either implemented or planned there. Uh, but in most countries and regions, th those options are not there. There's not the uh, opportunity in the reservoirs to not all reservoirs can uh, give you enhanced recovery it depends on the pressure condition of the reservoir whether it's depleted too much and uh, certainly carbon trading systems the european trading system for instance has been in existence for some time but it's not really effective because the the price of carbon there about less than 20 dollars a uh, ton of co2 does not really drive uh, it's it doesn't provide sufficient incentive for commercial pro processes. But if we look at two projects that have been driven by one of these two drivers, the Sleipner project in Norway was incentivized very much by the Norwegian carbon tax that came in uh, in the 1990s. And that carbon tax is of the order of $55 uh, dollars per ton. Uh, and this one megaton per of CO2 has been injected into the aquifer in the Sleipner field for uh, over 20 years now and that's a very successful project. If you look at uh, what claims to be the first really commercial process, uh, the SAS Power Boundary Dam project in Saskatchewan in Canada, uh, the driver there is EOR, uh, removing about a megaton of CO2 per annum as well uh, and using that for EOR in nearby depleted oil reservoirs with some going into an aquifer as well so we have evidence that where those drivers are there they they help uh, another key thing is that there's been a lot of focus of CCS on power and uh, this adds cost to that and it's competing with renewable energy coming down very rapidly in cost uh, such as wind and so uh, what we need to consider is what are the more difficult to decarbonize areas? Uh, industrial processes, there's, there's, uh, unless you were to completely electrify things where that's possible with very cheap renewable energy, then the only way to decarbonize most industrial processes, particularly those that produce CO2 as a product, is to use carbon capture and storage. Hydrogen production, uh, which is being considered now for heat and transport, you can get that from electrolysis of water, but you need cheap electricity to be able to do that. Uh, or if you're using fossil fuel energy, you, then of course you generate more CO2. Um, whereas steam, uh, methane reforming, uh, a conventional route for hydrogen production, uh, where you produce CO2 and hydrogen, if you take the CO2 out from that system, then uh, uh, you can actually produce uh, uh, green hydrogen by taking the CO2 out and having the hydrogen there for other applications. It's worth noting that over 20% of the total anthropogenic CO2 released globally of this uh, 800 gigatons that we've got to remove by 2050 uh, comes from industrial sources. So focusing just on power is not going to solve that problem. If we could take all that CO2 from industrial processes out, that would be a huge slice 
of this 10 gigatons per annum that we've got to remove by 2050. And as I've said, it, it's the most cost effective option for industrial decarbonization, CCS, combined, of course, with process efficiency optimization for both existing and new build plants. And I think for chemical engineers, combining process and resource efficiency with carbon capture and storage is one of the huge opportunities for chemical engineers to really contribute to this sector where um, uh, an, an enormous number of chemical engineers are employed and the recommendation of the report is to try and decarbonize this sector as quickly as possible 2030 may be uh, premature but i think it's worth having challenging targets to try and uh, address this problem and then we've talked about hydrogen which is seen as a leading contender to decarbonize heating now um, there you need to take out the CCS from steam methane, the uh, CO2 from steam methane reforming from natural gas or the uh, CO2 from syngas where we're using oil and heavy hydrocarbons. Um, but it could deliver low carbon hydrogen, the volumes and costs that are required locally, both for heating, but also for decarbonized transport by um, either hydrogen vehicles or fuel cell vehicles. And there are a number of projects I've just given uh, I'm most familiar with them, a couple of projects in the UK here in Leeds and the Liverpool Manchester area where there are hydrogen clusters being planned to provide uh, heating to over a million homes in Leeds and um, to uh, try and have localised hydrogen clusters to decarbonise heating and contribute to transport. So that's going to be a very important part of uh, the decarbonization these alternative uh, decarbonization to powers to decarbonize across the industrial sector now how do we bring costs down in process engineering generally well the first plant is normally more expensive and uh, we need to take the lessons of uh, process engineering into this field but multi-plant large-scale deployment will bring the price down in several ways by taking advantage of the economies of scale uh, the unit costs are high, but the cost per tonne of CO2 will come down and we will get cost reduction efficiency improvements through learnings by doing. As we go from the first to the nth plant, or typically from the first to the third or fourth plant, you can get 30 or 40 percent decrease in costs. And that's going to make an important contribution. And we can see here uh, some of the larger scales you see at the one to nine megaton uh, level uh, where uh, the learnings for instance from Sask Power is that plant which was built today was that savings could be uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, cost would be 30 to 40 percent lower because of what's being learned about the uh, how to improve the efficiencies of the different units and the, and the integrated part of that and um, of course as chemical engineers we don't need telling that systems engineering is a key thing when you're designing any process. The CCS process is particularly complex, both in terms of it, the engineering of its individual components, the power, the transport network, and the storage network underground. Um, and so uh, significant savings can be obtained as long as one takes a systems approach right across the whole of the CCS chain to optimize the costs and benefits, the benefits over that full value chain. Uh, there we have uh, energy industry where uh, BEX, where we want to actually take CO2 out of the system. And we've got the hydrogen generation. Uh, and these all fill, will feed into a transport network. And so developing transport infrastructure models that optimize the, the, co the location of the sources and the sinks and how we link these together. And then at a, a more macro level, how does CCS fit into the whole energy system? And we need a systems approach to actually optimize its integration with renewables and nuclear uh, and energy saving options in that. And of course, we will get different optimization scenarios in different regions. So some parts of the world will be very much more dominated by renewables. Others will need to use CCS more. And it requires engineers, particularly chemical engineers, to 
work with uh, governments and companies and different stakeholders to uh, ensure that a cradle to grave systems optimization approach is taken in order to again squeeze costs out of the system and to increase efficiency. So alongside those engineering ways of reducing cost, it's very much dependent on uh, the encouragement of investment and the incentives that are provided by government. So we need a combination of supportive policy frameworks from government and new business models for actually how the risk in this complex multi-component chain are shared. And so if we look at policy environment, we've talked about where we've got some uh, carbon uh, pricing at the moment. What, what's important, I think, is for companies and investors to have a stable enabling policy framework that uh, they know that there's going to be an environment in which introducing carbon capture and storage is going to be encouraged either by establishing effective carbon pricing, and that can be regional or international too, We've got to be careful to minimize carbon leakage. If we have carbon pricing in some regions, um, we've got to have mechanisms that prevent simply exporting manufacture and power generation to regions where there is no limitation on carbon emissions and we get the so-called carbon leakage. Um, and so the more multi-country international agreement we get there is possible. But then incentives and regulations that do encourage investment in CCS for power, for instance, that in the UK, there are contracts for difference uh, agreements, which guarantee if you put in a particular uh, renewable or nuclear uh, power service, that you're guaranteed um, electricity prices several decades into the future. And so that could be uh, applied to CCS and there might be equivalent mechanisms for gas and for heating uh, to guarantee that the initial investment can be, uh, there'll be a return on that that uh, makes the investment worthwhile. There could be incentives that encourage companies to uh, take CO2 out of industrial processes. So industrial capture contracts that require companies to commit to taking um, a certain amount of CO2 or to decarbonize their processes. Tax credits like the 45Q in the States for sequestration. And how could we take these national agreements and make them internationally tradable um, is a, another thing that needs to be looked at. So there's a lot for policymakers to do that could drive this process. But the other is fostering the supportive market conditions and uh, having commercial models that spread the risk equitably between uh, the different stakeholders. So this is a complex chain. And if you take, say, the capture of CO2 from power stations or from industrial plant, if the people that are generating the CO2 there have also got to pay for the transportation network, and if the people that are going to store the CO2 aren't guaranteed that there's going to be enough CO2 coming into the system, there's lots of risks that different members of the chain do not have control over. And so you've got the risk, particularly with these uh, intra-chain project and project risks, you've got uh, the availability of CO2 uh, if people put it in transport and storage networks, that that's going to reach capacity. And then you've got, of course, the long-term storage risk, that when you put the CO2 in place, who's going to take liability for actually ensuring that that stays in the ground for centuries? And uh, so that's something that companies that do the initial injection are not likely to take on board and something where no governments need to intervene. So I've summarised that on this slide where you've got the... Uh, the generators of CO2 are prepared to take the risk, if you like, inside the factory boundary. But once we get outside that to the transport and storage infrastructure and you have service providers, uh, this is where um, we need to share this risks and the costs between the public and the private sector, that there's sufficient uh, sharing of that risk that um, uh, investors and the, in, the companies themselves are prepared to uh, uh, rule the risks that they or control the risks and manage them that they have control over, but have some help with the ones that they, they don't. So 
things like publicly funded CO2 transport networks are being considered. And then having shared transport and infrastructure systems that are not there just for one project, but clusters of uh, industrial and uh, powered and hydrogen projects that can feed into a, uh, a shared infrastructure and network system. And so there's, there's a lot that needs to go into actually how you set up the business and how governments uh, locally can, can help that. And finally, I think an important factor uh, is to just improve uh, knowledge and awareness of the need for CO2 and the fact that this is a safe technology and can bring enormous benefits in terms of future generations and the, uh, the quality of life that they have if we're to avoid uh, catastrophic climate change. And so you know, sustaining dialogue between policy and decision makers and the technologists and the, the uh, uh, energy and industrial companies, uh, articulating the benefits and particularly increasing public understanding and policymaker understanding of, of both the need for this and the, uh, the current blocks and what can be done to enable it. Uh, and this has to be done, I think, on a country or region basis, because the the climate and the environment is different there in terms of this different balance of risks and drivers that are needed for this. Chemical engineers can make an enormous difference in this. If we look on this slide, I've just listed some of the things where chemical engineers skills technically in terms of systems analysis, design of networks, uh, large scale deployment and learning from uh, by doing and the medium long term technology uh, improvements in capture and storage technologies, uh, and also monitoring and verification long term, and alternative processes uh, by which we can actually take carbon out of the system um, by, for instance, mineral carbonization. Uh, but also by using their influence and their contacts to actually influence stakeholders of different sorts, policymakers and the public about the urgent need for this technology and how it can be implemented. And so I think the major messages from this um, uh, green paper, it's a green paper because uh, this is using UK jargon for an advisory paper. Uh, what we want to do is to use this paper to both inform uh, policymakers and people involved in commercialization of uh, CCS, but also to stimulate debate within inside the institution, particularly on a regional basis where CCS will have different roles in different parts of the world, and to get feedback and input to build on this report to produce some more uh, influential uh, policy positions that ICME can then uh, publish in, in, in a white paper as CCS globally, the debate continues and to try and influence its implementation worldwide. So the message for policymakers is twofold. Unless there's a market mechanism to monetize CO2 storage, carbon pricing of some sort, CCS will require an enabling and supportive policy framework that I've talked about that's stable and long-term. So people know what the rules of the game are and they, they reduce the risk of investment and reduce the cost of capital eventually. And they, you need to appropriately share the risk between government and uh, private sector uh, uh, to facilitate this rapid growth, particularly, say, in the transport infrastructure and long-term storage liabilities. For chemical engineers, there are tremendous opportunities, and we have a responsibility, I think, to make decarbonisation routine practice and to drive sustainability in the way that we design and improve processes. And finally, to supplies of finance, that CCS is a mature technology the technology is there, the risks are understood, and it's manageable, but we need to have an appropriate sharing of risk between the public and private sectors to enable financiers to invest in projects that there's an acceptable degree of risk and uh, some guaranteed returns on that investment. So that brings me to the end of my summary of the green paper. Um, we're now going to go on to time for questions and answers. Uh, I just wanted to say how we'd like to take the discussion forward. One aim of the Green Paper is, as I said, to stimulate discussion amongst us as a membership at large, to obtain a broader regional and global perspective and to develop um, 
a, a more globally accepted position on CCS and encourage members to play a role in, in, in managing uh, this energy transition and making it work. And so things you could do is to organize local discussion groups based on this webinar, the green paper and other materials, and to send your views in on how CC should play a role in your local region and play, play a part in future energy and industrial plans. And send those in to the energy center whose email address is there. And we will hope in the months ahead to actually bring together a more global input on this uh, than we were able to do in the Green Paper. There was international representation, but because CCS has only been implemented in relatively few countries, getting a view of where it sits in the future plans of particular regions uh, is not straightforward. And generally, you can register your interest by uh, taking part in energy center activities to develop ICME positions on future energy. So we're going to uh, now go into uh, question and answers. Alana, if you want to come in, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, that's very interesting. So yes, we've got a few questions coming in. So um, I'll start off with one um, from um, Ankit. He said, um, as pollution is increasing at a very high rate, um, what do you think, or how do you think carbon capture technology can fit into, um, you know, playing a part in, re in pollution reduction? Um, I, I think he may be not just meaning um, CO2 air pollution, but other forms of pollution as well. Yes, well, I think uh, CO2 and greenhouse gases, of course, are just one part of uh, pollution in the atmosphere. Uh, there are other uh, gases that are going to cause a problem. Uh, you know, we've over many decades now been trying to grapple with uh, uh, oxides of sulfur and oxides of nitrogen. And one thing we have to be one advantage of the uh, oxy fuel uh, approach is by taking the nitrogen out of the combustion gas before the process is that uh, you get a very great uh, uh, much greater reduction in oxides of nitrogen um, in the uh, flue gas and so it whilst we concentrate on capturing co2 uh, any process that's going to uh, reduce that is going to be beneficial and the alum cycle based on oxy fuel technology will, will do that as well the other thing of course is particulates and i think we need to ensure that any gas treatment processes that we're introducing for uh, greenhouse gas capture uh, and then storage also take into account uh, the reductions in particulates and that we build those both into re uh, reducing their production by uh, improvements in the processes themselves uh, but also by uh, making sure that those are not emitted alongside some of the gases that we're worried about. So I, the, the way I would see CCS fitting generally into pollution is that it will increase awareness that uh, it's not only for climate change, but for public health. We need to worry about what we're putting into the atmosphere. But some awareness of that, but this should be more proactive in process design. A lot of it is driven by legislation and regulation, but uh, the more we can actually have a holistic approach to reductions of uh, pollution uh, uh, through gaseous emissions, then I think this will uh, have a more integrated approach to improve process design that build this sustainability into uh, and environmental awareness into the way that we design processes. And then, of course, uh, you, you've got to have a similar approach for liquid emissions as well and uh, um, water streams are, are a key issue which have some effect on uh, uh, C CCS uh, in terms of water uses somewhere um, but that's a that's another issue for another day perhaps but I think the, the questioner uh, is right to point out that uh, it's not only uh, the CO2 that we should worry about. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, 
got a question here from Bill Cotton. Um, so I know there's mention of the use of biomass to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Clearly, this will require land that could be used to produce food for the world's growing populations. Um, I mean, he's asking for an eye community view on this ethical dilemma. Um, obviously, I can't present a, a view of all of our expert members online, but Jeff, do you, would you like to comment on that? Yes, indeed, Bill. That, that's a very important point. And I think uh, you know, a lot of studies are going on to uh, address this, as you say, ethical dilemma. Um, in fact, uh, again, one's got to look at this region by region, but uh, a, it's possible to use use uh, a lot of waste materials. So, uh, if you look at the way that biofuels have developed uh, in a, you know a, a different issue, uh, increasingly second generation there use the waste uh, biomass uh, after the corn and the, the wheat has been used, the husks and the, uh, the waste uh, uh, stems um, uh, are used. There's also an awful lot, of course, of biomass waste material that can be used for this process as well. And is it possible to grow energy crops on land that is not suitable for producing uh, agricultural crops for food, uh, low-grade land that can still be used to actually grow biomass specifically for uh, energy and uh, as, as a biofeedstock for chemicals for the future as we actually change from naphtha uh, as we wean ourselves in the long term off hydrocarbon feedstocks and go on to biomass feedstocks. A very important part of the, the, the future is looking at feedstocks as well as looking at emissions. And so I think the issue you raise, Bill, is absolutely paramount to ensure that this does not prejudice the, the, the growth of food supplies that are needed in many parts of the world and prejudice those where uh, uh, the current situation is critical in terms of food provision. Uh, from the studies I've seen, I think this, it is possible to have the volumes of biomass that we need but there may be an issue about transportation of biomass from parts where it's in plentiful supply to parts where it isn't. And then you have to look at emissions of transport, of whether you're getting net uh, CO2 reductions. Uh, so, so again, it's an illustration that we need to take a holistic systems view when we're looking at where we're taking CO2 out of the system, that we don't think we're doing it uh, a good job in one place, but uh, because of some of these other constraints, we raise CO2 levels in others. Thank you, Jeff. OK, we've got quite a few more questions coming in, so moving on swiftly. Um, we've got a couple of questions from Hak Kun Yeo. Um, due to the high costs and the need for strong public awareness and support, do you think CCS is becoming a preoccupation of developed nations while developing developing nations just end up buying them in the future and how can that trend be avoided so can i encouraging everyone to to adopt the technology very interesting question i think it is increasingly preoccupying the developed countries and i think this has got to be part of the solution globally because uh we're not going to be able to introduce these technologies in developing countries that want to exploit their own natural resources. Uh, you know, a lot of coal and hydrocarbons in, in countries that uh, have very rapidly expanding economies and they want to exploit those resources. So what we've got to do is to use uh, the rapid expansion of CCS in uh, Western Europe, in the United States, in Australasia, to bring the cost down and develop technologies to the point where uh, these then can be introduced in developing countries at as near to zero incremental cost as possible so that you get the benefits of the technology without uh, penalizing the uh, the energy or the heating provision uh, that people need there so i think one of the drivers in the developed countries is that industries are going to develop here that not only apply solutions locally, but actually have huge export potential uh, 
and for governments to realize that part of the way that they can help other countries achieve their share of the Paris agreements is by um, providing the technology uh, in uh, mutual trade agreements that are, are mutually beneficial. And so I think part of this CCS industry growth has got to be looking at export uh, and mutual benefit of working in partnership. And um, one of the things that hasn't been worked out about the implementation of the Paris Agreement, of course, is uh, exactly how the reduction of this uh, 800 gigatons of CO2 by 2050 is going to be apportioned. Uh, and so I think another part of this will be that where developed countries have got the capacity to take out a lot of CO2, that they take a greater share of that uh, reduction, enabling developing countries longer times to introduce the decarbonisation technology into their own systems. So I think this has got to be very carefully managed globally. And uh, uh, if we just do this in a few parts of the world and we neglect how this is going to be globalised over the next few decades, then, of course, we're not going to solve the problem. Thank you. Um, going to something slightly more technical, I'm going to come back to a policy question in a minute. Um, what do you think about new carbon capture technologies such as gas hydrates? Do you think these technologies are applicable for large scale CCS? Um, I think new technologies will have a, a major role to, to play, um, but they're not going to be the catalyst to reduce costs early on. Uh, we've got to get build at scale and to make the best of existing technology or incremental improvements on that. But I think in the longer term, alternative ways of storage and transport. So gas hydrates are very interesting, I think, in that you can use that to uh, capture uh, methane and CO2. Uh, you can use it as a storage me uh, mechanism. So people are talking about uh, some alternative to LNG as uh, using gas hydrates to transport gas um, under more mild conditions. And of course, you could use it uh, in natural hydrate systems to store CO2 and other greenhouse gases long term. So my feeling is that th these are areas people are working on. Uh, there's still challenges also in the capture area of some of the technologies I talked about earlier that where ideas work, but they're in the early stages of development. And what we've got to do is to use these to see whether they, in the end, bring greater cost reductions than some of the existing technologies and then phase them in as we get confidence both with the large scale use of CCS and where some of these newer technologies will fit in. But I think this is a, an example, I think, where for chemical engineers and uh, engineers generally, there are tremendous opportunities for right across the CCS chain uh, bringing in improvements over the next few decades that uh, couldn't address the previous question to some extent. If we've got much cheaper ways of, uh, or, or um, for, for, for countries that don't necessarily have the subsea storage or the subsurface storage, other ways of storing it, either as minerals in carbonization processes or as hydrates, that uh, this will help with the globalization of the more options we have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and fit in two last minute questions. Um, so the first one of those, Jeff, is what do you think the roles, if any, of um, investment um, banks are? The example that has been given in the question is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in helping fund CCS projects. What do you think the role of these organisations would be? Right, I'm not a financial expert, but from what I've seen of my engagement uh, in Europe recently in looking at the uh, all the barriers to implementation, I think that the investment banks have got a, a major role to play in facilitating this process because uh, this is going to, as I've said, the in introduction of these chains from capture, uh, but particularly outside that in terms of the storage networks, uh, the transport networks and then storage. Uh, this is going to need significant um, non-government investment. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, it will vary across the world, the amount that governments are prepared to put in. But I think uh, the investment banks, if they can see opportunities from some of these in, in initial projects, I think it, uh, the discussions between them and government about creating the right climate where they're willing to invest will be an important part of the process. So, yes, I, I see uh, sources of funding from investment banks uh, outside the participating uh, stakeholders in the uh, technology chain, a very important part of helping governments implement locally things that uh, are not driven by any of the commercial drivers that I mentioned, like EOR and uh, Hopefully, eventually, we'll have a global carbon price, but I think uh, private investment that uh, is willing to get a, re a return on some of these low carbon technologies, uh, there'll be tremendous opportunities, I think, uh, across the world for decarbonized products in the future. And that's where the banks can see investment possibilities. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and moving to a, a political question, which is actually very timely, given that this week we've had the announcement in the UK of an inquiry into um, encouraging adoption of um, CCS again. But I think it was 2016, um, the then UK Prime Minister, David Cameron, cancelled the £1 billion CCS competition in the UK. Do you have any kind of views on what the reasons, the government, why the government decided to do that, Jeff? I think that uh, at the time, uh, it was basically, uh, if you were looking for cost savings, um, one or two billion pounds that was being invested into a project that had yet to come to, to fruition, of which was not high on the political radar, uh, it was an easy thing to do. So the, the short answer is that um, uh, when it was done, Practically nobody noticed, apart from those that were actively involved in the uh, the competition itself. Um, I think there was also a lack of political commitment to uh, decarbonisation and some of the issues that since Paris uh, have become more and more prevalent. And so, I think uh, the current government, I think, has a much more uh, politically aware view of the need to decarbonize and with the clean growth strategy in the UK, but equivalent things around the world, um, is realizes that uh, CCS is on the critical path and it's not something nice to have, that renewables won't solve everything. Um, I think also the fact that some of the risks that I talked about were not built into the business models meant that uh, um, uh, the government was uh, did not see much future in terms, even if the competition was successful, of taking this process to further projects so that those weren't built into the system. So I think it was a combination of circumstances and political expediency. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh I think in the interest of time, uh, we're probably going to have to draw the questions to a close there. Um, so thank you for everyone who's listened and asked a question of Jeff. Um, and I'll hand over to Jeff for some closing remarks. Right, if I can get my uh, slides to work, thanks very much for attending today and thanks for those very interesting questions. Hopefully you will continue this debate individually in, in groups in your regions. Perhaps we could just have an exit poll to see in the light of what we've discussed whether uh, your, your view has changed and uh, do you uh, still think it will play a significant role? And those of you that weren't sure, has the uh, debate today changed your mind? So we can just briefly look, I think, at uh, where we are on that. And I think uh, as the poll comes in, there's a slight increase in those that think that it will play a significant role. And uh, those that don't, I think, uh, if anything, may have gone up a bit. Uh, but what, what's changed, I think, is that the number that are not sure about it has, has, has gone down to 10% or so. So hopefully debate like this will help clarify the, the position, what, whatever view you take in terms of how it will be useful, particularly in your own region. So thanks again for your participation today.
So we can turn the poll off now, I think, Alana. 77% yes. Okay, thank you for that, Jeff. Um, so yes, so there was a clear, clear change in that. Um, in terms of seventy-seven percent of people said yes, it would. It was a good technology, and that was eighty-three percent of all the attendees voted. So thank you very much for that. Okay, well, perhaps I could just say goodbye to everybody. Thanks for joining, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Goodbye, everybody.